So we can start uh, with the uh, pool. Just uh, a little glimpse because uh, there's no need to add uh, anything else uh, with respect to what we just saw in the videos. So the uh, Soplos uh, is a, a revolution for the TensorFlow ecosystem because uh, initially TensorFlow uh, was uh, hard. It was difficult because uh, programmers are not used to think uh, using the imperative here in the descriptive programming way of language. And uh, they are used to use a programming uh, style that is imperative. That means uh, you write code and you execute it. Okay. You just uh, write code and you execute it. <coughs> but uh, instead, with the TensorFlow 1.0, you have to first describe the computation using a data flow graph and then create the graph, put it inside the session, and let the hardware execute the graph. And uh, as we see uh, with TensorFlow 2.0, they just uh, break everything and uh, make the eager mode the default. That's more uh, user friendly. Uh, okay, since we just saw the video, there's no need to repeat uh, these things. In particular, just uh, something that perhaps in the video was not shown. Okay, uh, Keras is the new standard, is the new official way to build machine learning models. Before, there was the TF. layers that uh, every machine learning practitioner was used to and uh, was loving. But uh, they forced us to switch to Keras, uh, and uh, initially the migration was uh, not easy, but uh, in the end, uh, the choice of using Keras uh, was uh, good. Uh, the API of TensorFlow has been uh, really cleaned up. Uh, in particular, uh, okay, uh, renaming and uh, stuff like that uh, was fixed, uh, but the constrict model, the tf.constrict, that was a whole bunch of projects inside a single project that was a terrible uh, design decision has been removed, and this is uh, great news. And uh, the overall uh, software engineering part of TensorFlow has been uh, improved because uh, there are no more global collection, uh, there are, uh, the, we have to use objects and uh, not uh, define variables somewhere and then uh, use the df.graph that gets variable by name from everywhere in the source code. Okay, uh, so this is the main part of uh, the talk and this is divided in uh, two parts. The first part uh, is uh, just uh, pure theory about the generative of the cellular networks, and the second part is the and so on. So, this is the Google Colab. Okay. So, this is uh, a very schematic representation of uh, what a GAN is. So, GAN, just by reading the first line, are a framework for the estimation of a generative models via an adversarial training process, in which two models, the discriminator and the generator, are trained simultaneously. What does it mean? It means that we have this setup, in which we have a generator that is a model, or more in general, is just a mapping function that goes from random noise to a something, a data distribution, and a training set that is uh, our uh, goal. And then we have uh, this discriminator, uh, which um, is only goal is to discriminate between the real and the fake samples. In particular, <coughs> the, the idea that uh, Ian Goodfellow, the creator of the GAN, introduced is to train uh, the Generative the, to train a, a generative model using an adversarial training process. This means that at the beginning of the training, the generator and the discriminator doesn't know anything about each other, but the generator must learn how to create something fake that looks like the training set by using only the signal that comes from the discriminator. The discriminator is just a binary classifier that uh, his goal is to say, okay, my input is, is real or is fake. The great power of the uh, adversarial uh, training process is that both the generator and discriminator can be 
map in function, and in particular can be neural network, and therefore we can train them using uh, gradient descent. And so, as we can see here in this formula, this is the original formulation of the problem. Uh, the problem uh, of the adversarial training has been posed uh, as a min-max game in which we have these uh, two agents that are competing each other. As we can see from the value function definition, uh, the, <coughs> the discriminator has the aim of maximizing these two terms. The first term is just uh, the probability of correctly classifying samples coming from the true data distribution. The second term is just the probability of correctly classifying as fake the samples generated by the generator. The, um, <coughs> instead, the generator has a goal of minimizing only one term of this equation, the second one. The second one is exactly the, its goal is exactly to fool the discriminator. So while the discriminator tries uh, to minimize uh, this term, when the discriminator tries to maximize this term, so to correctly classify the fake data as fake, the generator tries to create data that looks like the real one. Perhaps uh, some of you may have noticed that in this second term, if the <coughs> discriminator uh, won, that means uh, it correctly classifies the sample G in Z with uh, the value of uh, zero. This uh, second term saturates. What does it mean? Because it becomes the logarithm of uh, one minus zero. And therefore, when we go to compute this uh, loss term and we take the gradient, the gradient of zero, of course, uh, is zero. And therefore, uh, we can't train the generator. Is that? Uh, Ian Goodfellow noticed uh, this uh, behavior and in practice he suggested to train uh, the generator in a different way. The min-max game is always the same. The discriminator should also correctly classify real and uh, fake samples. But the generator goal is no more to classify this term, so to the generator goal is no more to minimize the probability of the discriminator of correctly classifying the, the, the data, but the goal of the generator is to generate the better sample as possible. In practice, the new value function becomes uh, this value function, and uh, what the models are doing uh, is to just uh, playing the same, ba the same game, but in a different manner. So it's no more a min-max game, but it's a maximization game for the discriminator and also a maximization game for the generator. Of course, uh, as I said uh, in the introduction, the power of the framework comes from the fact that uh, <coughs> both models can be neural networks. And of course, we can reuse all the previous knowledge from the other domains. For instance, if we are, we are working with a couple of numbers, we can uh, just uh, use uh, fully connected neural networks without any problem. We are using uh, text, uh, why not? We can use a uh, recurrent neural network in order to create uh, a text generator. We are using images, there are uh, the convolutional neural network, and therefore we can use them to create uh, an uh, image generator. It, uh, everything depends uh, on uh, the data type. So, uh, how can we train the GAN? This is uh, the, in the real uh, innovation that the adversarial training process uh, introduced. In particular, the playing this uh, min-max game or max-max game is the alternative execution of training steps. Uh, in practice, uh, the, uh, the agents are just uh, following the rules. The rules is that the discriminator starts first. And it repeats uh, these uh, three points. In practice, uh, we just have to sample uh, a number m of uh, noise prior. These are the input of the generator. We can sample also m examples from the real data distribution. And then we can train the model just by maximizing the loss function we previously defined. Of course, uh, we can't maximize an expected value, and therefore we just replace the expected value with the empirical mean over the batches. 
The generator uh, is exactly the same. It must play after the discriminator. And uh, it's pretty easy because uh, in this case, we are uh, expressing the loss function as the non-separating uh, value function. And of course, uh, this is uh, the maximization of the non-separating value function. And of course, uh, since uh, we are using gradient descent, we are using neural network uh, for our models, we can, uh, without any problem, uh, uh, train them, compute the gradient, uh, and then use uh, any standard uh, optimization algorithm like uh, Adam uh, or stochastic gradient descent or whatever to apply the updates. So this is the intuitive uh, idea. And uh, the train uh, must uh, go on until uh, the generator uh, has learned how to generate uh, samples, really good samples. But how can we understand if the generator uh, is generating something uh, meaningful? The problem uh, here uh, can be solved by looking at the output of the discriminator. In fact, if uh, the discriminator output uh, a probability of uh, 0.5, that means uh, that uh, he has no idea if the input presented is a real or a fake discriminator or a fake uh, value, and therefore he can uh, just uh, run on guess. So uh, this is the basic uh, idea and the, and the original idea uh, introduced by Kutzfellow in uh, 2014, and. Uh, in the recent years, uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, development uh, of the GAN framework uh, and uh, developed a lot of uh, GANs. And uh, we can see that uh, there are two main uh, categories, uh, categories of the GANs. The unconditional, that's the one we just described here, and the conditional. The conditional is just a simple, uh, very simple extension of the GAN framework in which uh, we just uh, feed not only uh, an input that can be a noise vector or the real uh, input data, but also a condition. And creating a conditional uh, GAN, what does it mean? It means that if we learn the data distribution, we can also force this data distribution to be conditioned. For instance, we are creating a generator of uh, image digits, this one below. And of course, uh, we can just uh, say to the generator to generate uh, the, the values given a, a given condition. For instance, uh, we can pass the label uh, 1, 2, 3, and uh, the generator at every new input noise and uh, that uh, given specific label will produce uh, the sample that uh, we expect. Of course, it's the training, uh, it's the training as well. Extending the GAN framework just extends the value function by adding a conditioning term. So instead of sampling from the real data distribution, we sample from the real data distribution conditioned on the condition. And the same goes for the generator, because the generator now is conditioned too. So the, a quick overview of the applications of the GANs. Of course, we have an unconditional generator. We can generate images or we can generate numbers, but in practice what it means is that we have something that has learned a data distribution, and this is uh, the main strength of the GAN framework, of the generative models. And there are astonishing results, astonishing results, for instance, uh, this is another unconditional generator, but uh, of very realistic phases. I guess uh, many of you have visited that on the website, uh, this person does not exist. And uh, these are images uh, gathered from uh, this website. And uh, this is uh, pretty crazy because these people uh, really doesn't exist. Also, they look uh, really, really natural. So the, uh, there are the <coughs> other applications. There are, of course, there is the like conditional generation of something easy. But perhaps given a condition more complex than a single label, of course, we can do something like the domain translation. The domain translation is a bit crazy because we can do something like given a semantic representation of an input to generate a realistic scene or uh, even glorify a black and white image or doing uh, crazy stuff like going from a sketch from edges to a realistic photo. And uh, this is uh, the exact idea, the same idea of the conditional gun, but given a condition that's more complex. Not a single scalar, scalar value, but uh, an image as a condition. 
and an application, of course, and a super resolution, and, and are uh, always a specialization of the conditional IAM framework. So this is the quick, quick overview. And now we can go have a look at the code. So how to write a GAM from scratch using uh, TensorFlow Supernova. And uh, we can... Paolo. Zoom. Zoom. So how to write uh, a simple unconditional GAN from scratch using uh, only pure uh, TensorFlow to Beno. And uh, everything uh, is available online, therefore uh, you, you can find the material and you can uh, run everything uh, on uh, this uh, Jupyter notebook. Um, okay, we can start. Uh, the first thing to do using the notebook uh, is to change uh, the runtime because we are going to use uh, GPU in order to speed up the calculation. So we are going to change the runtime and uh, set it to the GPU. And then instead of uh, installing uh, the version uh, pre of uh, TensorFlow, we just go the, using the nightly, that is uh, the build of uh, today of the master branch uh, of the TensorFlow repository. It will take some time to start everything we need. But of course, uh, we can uh, have a look at, <coughs> at uh, what is uh, our goal. Our goal uh, is uh, to learn a data distribution. Our target distribution uh, is uh, a simple uh, random normal distribution with uh, a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 0.1. Since uh, in uh, TensorFlow 2.0 we have uh, eager mode by default, we can uh, just use uh, TensorFlow itself to generate uh, the data set. As soon uh, as the setup is ready, we can go on. So by, by the, in any way, what uh, we are going to do here is to first gather the data, then uh, create the models using uh, the Keras API, and in particular not uh, the sequential, but using the functional, only because uh, it, I just found that the functional API is uh, more handy to use. Then, then we are going to implement the adversarial training that using eager execution and the tf.function annotation, it's just easy to implement because it's straightforward being a sequential set of operation of the training steps between models. And the tf function allow us to speed up the computation. Okay. So we can start by importing the required packages. Uh, as I said before, we can uh, use uh, TensorFlow itself uh, as a data generator because, of course, it has a random package and uh, we are going to create uh, our uh, target distribution that is uh, the normal distribution uh, written here with a mean of 10 at standard deviation of 1. And we are going to plot this in order to have a graphi graphical representation of uh, which is our target distribution. Of course, having a small variance uh, is uh, picked uh, on uh, the value set. Following uh, the, Keras, uh, <coughs> the Keras specification, uh, we can uh, define our generator and discriminator network. <coughs> Defining uh, the network uh, is uh, straightforward, and uh, there is uh, no constraint uh, in uh, how to define them. Of course, uh, this is uh, a really simple problem. We are just, uh, our goal is just uh, to create a generator model that once invoked, uh, it generates uh, a single scalar value or a bunch of scalar values. <coughs> and uh, therefore, our uh, only constraint is to have uh, a single output unit that is uh, the scalar we are going to, uh, we are going to generate. The discriminator uh, is exactly the same. The only thing to note <coughs> 
is that uh, the activation function of the output layer that is this part, there is there isn't. So this is a linear uh, activation function. And uh, we are going to use uh, this linear activation function because uh, when we are going uh, to train the models, <coughs> the model uh, will be trained using a keras built-in loss function that will apply the squashing of this neuron in the probability range, so in the zero one range, in a numerically stable way. And therefore, uh, we just delegate this operation to keras instead of doing it by ourselves. So these uh, two functions uh, are just the model definition, and in particular, they return a Keras model. <coughs> and uh, since we have the function able to return the model, we have just to define and uh, use the model as uh, we expect. So we define that the discriminator D that expects uh, an input shape of one because uh, the target uh, is a scalar. <coughs> and the generator that uh, accepts uh, an input lattice space of 100, that is the size of the noise prior that the generator uses uh, to create the samples. Even here, uh, there is no constraint, uh, there are no rules about uh, the shape of the lattice space, but uh, 100 is uh, a standard, and therefore uh, almost uh, everyone uses a vector of 100. So, Implementing uh, the loss function is uh, straightforward. It's really straightforward because uh, TensorFlow <coughs> Keras in particular comes uh, with a TF Keras losses package that contains a lot of uh, ready to use functions. And uh, we just have to look at the formula of the binary cross entropy in order to understand that this is the, the loss function we need to create uh, our adversarial training process implementing the non saturated value function. In particular, <coughs> if you look at the formula, you can see that the binary cross entropy is just uh, the binary cross entropy between the two distributions. The <coughs> target distribution uh, and the <coughs> predicted distribution that is uh, y hat. And uh, if we just uh, say that our target distribution is uh, just the real and fixed, are just the real and fixed samples, and therefore, we assign uh, to the real samples the level of one and to the fixed samples the level of two, and we just substitute to y the values of uh, zero and one, we obtain uh, two different terms. <coughs> the first term is the correct classification of the real samples. So if we just place uh, uh, one here, <coughs> if we just place uh, a one, uh, if we just replace the y, in practice, uh, we obtain uh, the first uh, term, and uh, if we just replace the y with a zero, we obtain uh, the second term. Or maybe the opposite. <laughs> so using TensorFlow is uh, really straightforward because it's just a matter of uh, implementing uh, the loss functions using uh, the package. The discriminator loss function is just the sum of two binary cross entropy, one that classifies the real output uh, and uh, with the distribution uh, of the level one, and the other one uh, is the classification of the generated output uh, with the fake distribution of the level zero. The generator loss function uh, is uh, the non-saturating loss function, and so we have just uh, to <coughs> implement it, and this is, uh, once again, uh, the binary cross entropy between the level one and the generated output. So this is the implementation of the adversarial training process. The adversarial training process uh, is uh, straightforward because uh, we can just uh, have a look at the paper. The paper describes uh, the rules uh, that uh, the discriminator and the generator have to follow in order to create the adversarial training process. And uh, we just uh, implement it step by step. This, uh, before the TensorFlow 2.0, was just uh, really hard because we had to condition manually everything in the order of the, of the execution uh, and it uh, wasn't uh, easy at all. But uh, in uh, TensorFlow 2.0, we can just uh, say, okay, execute uh, line by line what uh, uh, I ask you to execute. And therefore, we just uh, can <coughs> sample the real data. 
So this is uh, our patch of uh, real data. And this is uh, the noise vector. <coughs> this is, is, uh, is just the input of the generator. And then we use this noise vector to sample from the generator. So we generate the fake data, a batch of, of fake data. We compute the discriminator loss by feeding the discriminator once with the fake data. And therefore, we get the value of the discriminator on the fake data. The same for the real data. And then we use the function we defined above to compute the discriminator loss function. <coughs> and we should feed uh, the correct value. <coughs> this is uh, the computation of the loss uh, of the discriminator. And uh, the same goes uh, from the generator. The generator just needs the generator, uh, the generated output that is the value of the discriminator when it's fed uh, with the fake data. The peculiarity is uh, <coughs> the implementation of the training. The, of the training. <coughs> because, uh, OK, there are no more graphs uh, in uh, TensorFlow 2.0. But this is uh, more or less uh, not true, because of course we have to take care of uh, what happened uh, under the hood. Because uh, if you <coughs> need to compute the gradient uh, of a, you need to compute the gradient of a certain uh, <coughs> set of operation, you have to build a graph representation of the computation, and then do the forward and backward passes over this uh, representation. And in order to keep track of the operation executed, we have to use the concept of uh, gradient tape. Mm -hmm. The tape is just a monitor of what happens inside this context. In particular, mm, tapes mm, at default are not persistent. What does it mean? It means that a tape just captures what happens inside the context and when it's used, so to compute the gradient on the first line, the tape gets destroyed automatically by TensorFlow. So in the second operation, in the second execution, uh, this uh, invocation uh, will rise an error. In order to use the same tape, so the same context, to compute the gradient two times, but once from the discriminator trainable variables, so once to update the discriminator, and once to update the generator, we have to define the tape as persistent and manually keep track of uh, the memory and the deleting by Python, using Python this object. There is uh, an alternative to create uh, these uh, forward and backward passes, that is to create two tapes. So you can just write with the accurate tape as tape one and the same as tape two, and uh, use them to compute the gradients separately. Of course, uh, this is uh, not convenient uh, if you have the very same step, the very same execution, and the very same uh, variables, and the very same graph to keep track. It just makes no sense, and therefore, uh, the suggestion is to use a persistent tape that has the disadvantage of uh, having to manually take care of the memory. This way of uh, training the models is uh, different from uh, the one that has been presented in the videos above. So we are not using uh, the Keras uh, feed and uh, compile methods, but we are writing by ourselves a custom training loop. Since we are creating uh, an adversarial training uh, using the Keras standard methods uh, is uh, difficult because uh, they have uh, been created to work with the classificator in practice. And therefore, uh, the standard training loop has just been defined to work with a single uh, target and instead and, and with a single model. But in this case, this is more complex we have because we have uh, two, co two models. And uh, moreover, these models are interacting. And uh, perhaps uh, this is the best way using the support to know to write uh, a custom training loop. Because, uh, of course, you have the control on uh, everything that happens uh, inside the loop. So let's say this uh, function, uh, train step, uh, has been uh, also uh, decorated with the function because uh, we want to speed up the computation. So everything uh, defined uh, here just uh, become converted uh, to a graph, so agnostic representation that can be placed uh, on a GPU and uh, work faster. And of course, uh, in order to train our models, uh, once we have uh, made the forward pass and the backward pass by computing the gradients, uh, we have to apply the gradients uh, using the apply rule, 
the apply rule is defined by the optimizer. In this case, we just defined a single optimizer that is uh, the Adam optimizer with uh, this uh, standard uh, learning rate. And we can use the same optimizer to apply the gradients computed for the discriminator to the discriminator of the number variables. And the same optimizer again to apply the update rule to the generate of tenable variables using the generator data. And uh, in uh, this, uh, I guess, uh, 15 uh, line of code, we have the wall uh, adversarial training. Of course, uh, the training of the discriminator uh, stand uh, in the theory wants that you can uh, loop to from uh, one to key times. So therefore here, it would be better to add a for loop uh, using uh, for uh, e in the tf range because we are annotating the function with tf dot function, and this is important uh, if you want to extend this uh, training loop to train uh, the discriminator more than one time, and uh, not using a for e in a range because otherwise uh, the tf function conversion uh, will be just wave because uh, this is a, a little bit complex. Because in practice, what happens uh, is that with a uh, when <coughs> the for loop is correctly converted, therefore we have uh, a for e in the tf dot range, and we are looping over the tensor. The graph conversion works uh, as we expected, and therefore we can accelerate really the execution for uh, key times. But instead, if we use uh, the for e in a range, uh, the graph conversion doesn't work. And therefore, we have uh, in the graph converted code, the same code repeated key times. Okay. So using the function is uh, a little bit uh, complicated. And in short, uh, you have to use uh, the test of flow methods uh, everywhere. But however, uh, this is the, same, the simple implementation of the adversarial training process with the update of the variables. And uh, this is the real training loops. So the training loop uh, in uh, we just uh, train the model and we visualize uh, the generator and discriminator loss uh, every 200 uh, time steps. And uh, more importantly, we uh, visualize, so we sample from the target distribution and from the learned distribution from the generator, a number of uh, data points, mm -hmm. 2,000, 5,000 uh, data points, from both, and uh, we visualize it uh, on a histogram in order to see what happens uh, during the training. Executing the adversarial training process, straight forward. So, as you can see, the flash is bad, okay? The target uh, distribution is the orange one, and uh, of course, uh, as you can see, it varies because, of course, we are sampling from the from a random normal distribution, and uh, <coughs> it's not a constant value. And uh, in blue, you can see the same numbers of data points uh, that are being sampled from the generator. Of course, uh, as you can see, the generator distribution uh, is uh, changing uh, its uh, shape every step. And it slowly will approach uh, the target distribution. Of course, uh, it will take uh, a lot of time and uh, maybe not so much time. But in order to speed up, <coughs> there's uh, this uh, handy Python script, that I, Python bash script, that use uh, image magic, that uh, creates uh, from, uh, <coughs> from uh, a list of uh, sorted uh, images, a uh, handy slowly JSON using a GIF. And for uh, <coughs> here, we can see a better version of the training loop. And as you can see, <coughs> and as you can see, yes, at the end of the training, the mean has been learned pretty fast, and the variance of the generator of the generator distribution is approaching the 0.1 variance. And therefore, uh, yes, our uh, simple gun has learned mm -hmm. how to behave uh, like a normal distribution uh, with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of uh, 0.1. And this is uh, pretty cool because, uh, of course, now we have a, a parametric model that behaves uh, like uh, a distribution. But of course, this is a didactical example. And uh, if instead uh, of uh, something from a, number, from a normal distribution, our goal was to generate images, uh, get rid from a 
way more complex distribution, like the distribution of all the cut pictures in the domain of the pictures. And our training set contains all the cut pictures. Yes, it is possible by using the very same training group, just by changing the discriminator and the generator architecture. Instead of using fully connected, we can use convolutional neural network with the convolution operation in order to build a generative model able to generate images. So there are some advantages and disadvantages. Of course, this is something really, really short in order to <coughs> just show how to create the adversarial training loop to define the models but uh, to create a real uh, and uh, more or less say production ready pipeline, we have to keep track of uh, the loss values using TensorBoard. We have to visualize uh, not in this way, but using the TensorBoard histogram feature, the data distribution that changes over the time. So in this way, we can keep track of multiple experiments. We have to set the model. There are a lot of things that we haven't do in uh, this uh, notebook, but of course, in a, exactly like in a TensorFlow 1.0, we can uh, just uh, use a checkpoint and save and restore the parameter model uh, when we need. And that's it. So, <coughs> and more importantly, uh, as we see in the video, we haven't used uh, any data input pipeline because uh, we just use the TensorFlow itself to create uh, the target uh, distribution. But uh, of course, if we, we work with images uh, or uh, if we work with uh, a huge data set, uh, the golden rule is to use the TF data, data set API. That is uh, really the, perhaps the most beautiful part of the whole uh, TensorFlow framework is uh, really well engineered. And that's it. So this is, uh, uh, these uh, two notebooks are uh, just part of a more uh, huge uh, set of notebooks that we, we use at, uh, at work for presentation. And uh, if you're interested, uh, you can go on uh, GitHub, uh, on the company website, github.com slash Zulutech, and you can find uh, the whole list uh, of the notebook. Of course, uh, in uh, this uh, micro course on GANS with TensorFlow 2.0, you can find how to create, okay, the theory of the GANS, how to create a GAN from scratch using TensorFlow 2.0, how to create a conditional GAN from scratch using uh, TensorFlow 2.0 and uh, a whole section of the estimator API that uh, it's more or less deprecated because, uh, okay, in the video we saw that they said uh, the estimator will remain, but in practice uh, is not still uh, updated to the TensorFlow 2.0 API, and uh, you have to use uh, the compatibility mode inside uh, the Estimator. Therefore, you are still defining a graph, and you have to reason just like uh, you were used to in the TensorFlow 2 one. So the estimator, uh, I don't know if they will keep it uh, as they said, because they are uh, about on it. But in particular, yeah. So that's it. This is uh, the short uh, introduction to GANs and data set training process using TensorFlow. This is uh, the simple way to write a custom training loop using the gradient tape, a simple way how to create the models using Keras and the Keras model API. And uh, this is uh, the GAN introduction and the then some part of the whole tutorial. So we can just go back and jump to the conclusion. The conclusion uh, is that, okay, TensorFlow is uh, still uh, in the early stage of development. Uh, as Martin Wick said, uh, Martin Wick said uh, okay, TensorFlow should be released by the, uh, by the end of spring, uh, but uh, this is uh, just uh, not true. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> So we have to wait. In the, the next week, we'll be releasing the first uh, beta of uh, TensorFlow, of TensorFlow 2.0. And of course, uh, this is not uh, yet uh, ready for production. 
at work uh, we are trying uh, to use uh, everything they said in the video so we have tried it with the distribution strategies uh, and uh, TF function based everywhere and uh, this is not production ready of course uh, you have to struggle a lot or you have to stick with cares so if you have uh, problems that are uh, so we can say more or less standard the keras uh, api is already ready to work uh, perfectly with the distribution strategies uh, with tf function you just uh, use it but instead you have to write a custom training group uh, as uh, we said uh, in the previous slide this is just uh, too difficult for instance uh, the distribution strategies are uh, not ready to use because uh, they said uh, yeah um, you can use uh, the TensorFlow distribution strategy just by placing your code inside the scope. This is uh, not true yet, because you have to change your code in order to make it work. Because, uh, for instance, uh, you have to use something like uh, the experimental run, experimental run of a distribution strategies that works on an iterator and this, this iterator is an iterator of the TensorFlow 1.x that API that, is, that is, has been removed from the TensorFlow Supernova. Therefore, uh, there is still a lot of room for improvement in uh, the porting and the real the realization of TensorFlow Supernova that they are working hard and uh, this is, uh, however, a great, great uh, project and uh, it's a in my opinion, the best framework here from machine learning. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is uh, the main part of the talk, uh, and uh, it's pretty much uh, finished. So this is just a uh, last uh, self promotion. I'm uh, authoring a book about uh, these topics. These topics uh, are, uh, for instance, uh, the TensorFlow architecture from the graph, the graph definition from the upgrade to the TensorFlow Supernova, so here execution and everything that's new in TensorFlow Supernova. And uh, the whole book is designed using a hands-on approach. Therefore, we start from a problem uh, that we can solve using a neural network. We try to solve it using TensorFlow Supernova, and we try to understand if it is possible to develop an application using the super Supernova and uh, create something uh, production ready. Of course, uh, there is also a newsletter and if you want it, uh, you can uh, subscribe it. So that's it. Thank you. I think we at nine, so uh, maybe we can do the Q&A quickly here, and then we can continue the aperitivo. So we have five to ten minutes of uh, questions. Uh, we have the microphones here. Okay, okay so if you have any questions for uh, Paolo? Okay, first, second. So I would be interested in uh, using this kind of networks for text generation. Do you have any advice uh, like from a theoretical standpoint or an aim from uh, how to approach the problem in terms of proof So for uh, the text generation point of view, are you talking about uh, something easy like uh, a recording neural network that works on charters like char RNN or something complex? Nope, we have embeddings by like word level. So you have to have a look uh, to the various uh, Keras implementation of the RNNs uh, and all uh, the recurrent models, but you have to really, really, really um, have care of uh, understanding if is it, is it working as you expect. Because uh, right now there are something, uh, of course, this is an alpha release and uh, in a few days there will be out of the release. So this is not production ready, and uh, my suggestion uh, is uh, if you want to do uh, research uh, on uh, deep learning and machine learning, stick with a framework that you know that works. 
So TensorFlow 1.13.14. And if you want instead to go on with the research on the engineering part of you, then you have to switch to TensorFlow Supernova because the whole programming paradigm will change. But of course, going back to your question, have a look uh, at the various uh, already ready to use layers uh, in the tf.keras package because uh, perhaps uh, this is the best uh, solution to every recurrent, uh, recurrent problem. Of course, uh, you have uh, out of the box uh, the good acceleration for it's worth a try. Thanks. Somebody here? Just a quick question. I didn't really get if the generator has some previous knowledge about the distribution. I mean, is it just trying to understand and uh, find the right parameters the mean and the variance, or has any other knowledge about the distribution so it knows that it's normal distributed? So the generator uh, is uh, not even trying to estimate the mean and the variance. The generator starts uh, just from a random vector um, that is, uh, for instance, uh, but just uh, for a uh, pure uh, choice, a uh, normal distribution with a mean, uh, unit mean and a zero variance, but uh, this is uh, not related with the output. So the output uh, is uh, just learned through the adversarial training process, and the output uh, is not the pair of parameters, uh, mean and variance, but is a single scalar. So it has no previous knowledge about uh, the data, and there's uh, no previous uh, knowledge about uh, the variables is learn, is learning. So no, to, there are no two neurons uh, in output, therefore, and just uh, the single value. And uh, this is the strength of the adversarial training process because uh, just by the generator must learn to emulate the target distribution just uh, by using the signal that comes from the discriminator. That's it. Does the fact that the random vectors is filled with samples from normal distribution affect the velocity at which the generator learns? So if we want to generate, for example, images, is it faster to train the generator if we bed in with some images? Yeah. In, in reality, for instance, the, in the domain translation uh, application, so the well-known uh, pixel-to-pixel -pix architecture, this is, uh, uh, of course, this is a conditional generation that starts uh, from an image. And uh, so starting from a random vector uh, is uh, a challenging problem because you have to start from a random vector of the numbers and then the upsampling convolution just learn how to produce something that has a meaning. But instead, if you, let's say, encode a prior knowledge, of course, but you have to design a whole new architecture, so for instance, piece to piece, or something like uh, using the UNET uh, architecture for semantic segmentation, you can encode a condition in an image fashion, and then forward, in, uh, forward to the end. But of course, I haven't never tried this because uh, I don't know if I feed to a unit a mask of noise, perhaps the output will always be noise. But if the input image is something like a blue image and I want to generate a cat, maybe it can help, but uh, it's really pure search. Any other question? I'm sorry, this. I didn't get how uh, like uh, misclassification of the discriminator affects the adversarial training process. How the misclassification of the discriminator affects the generator? <laughs> No, no, also in the graph. How it is, if the. In the code? Is, no, no, in conceptually, the discriminator makes an error, how it affects the generator, the process of the generator. 
Thinking an error means uh, to specify something from the generator as a real uh, number. Ah, OK. So instead of uh, producing uh, real when the, output, the when the input is real, uh, produces uh, fake when the input is real? Yes, exactly. OK, so a misclassification. Well, uh, it just uh, give the generator a different uh, signal. For instance, you can just uh, think about uh, the direction of the updates. The direction of the updates of the parameter of the generator comes uh, from the signal that comes from the discriminator. The discriminator, therefore, if uh, correctly classifies the samples, gives uh, as a feedback to the generator a certain direction. If is, uh, the discriminator is being fooled in practice, what does it mean? It means that uh, the direction of the updates just uh, changes, and therefore uh, this uh, should uh, move uh, the whole training process in order to uh, equilibrium. Because uh, in the end, this, uh, the discriminator must be wrong. Okay? And uh, this uh, will uh, bring uh, the whole training uh, to an uh, equilibrium point. This equilibrium point uh, is uh, due to the nature of this kind of problem because this is uh, a zero sum uh, min max game. So, this is uh, the effective goal of the whole uh, adversarial training process. The discriminator must be fooled, and uh, they affect uh, in order to just the update uh, sometimes uh, go towards up, other times goes down, and therefore. Uh, on average, uh, the discriminator send to the generator uh, a message that, okay, you can improve more than this. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the, the idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so in theory, at the, at the end of the process, the discriminator should uh, uh, discriminate all the values as real, because if the uh, distributions overlaps. <coughs> How does this, this uh, the discriminator can understand uh, which is the distribution that the sample is coming from? Because you have to think about uh, this uh, formulation uh, it's just like uh, <coughs> you have to think about this formulation just like a probabilistic uh, formulation. Therefore, if you look at the discriminator just like a classifier. Of course, uh, you expect that the output uh, will be just okay. The target, the, the generator distribution is approaching the target distribution. Therefore, the discriminator should classify everything correctly. But we are training both models. Training the both models means that the generator is generating the values correctly, and the discriminator, at the beginning of the training, was able to correctly classify real and fake samples. But during the adversarial training process, uh, if you think about this, <laughs> the only thing that uh, can do is uh, pay food. So it's uh, a little bit uh, strange. But if you, if you think they are competing, so the generator is generating samples uh, that uh, look like uh, more and more like the original. But uh, the generator is uh, using the signal that comes from the discriminator. So this is uh, the, the, the fact that makes, uh, at the end of the training, uh, the discriminator just generate uh, a random guess. Because uh, at the beginning, it was able to generate, to correctly classify everything, real and false. But now, he has uh, no idea of what uh, something real looks like. More or less, uh, it should be uh, interactive idea. Can you mention uh, some real case uh, where you apply this algorithm? OK. Uh, perhaps I'm under NDA for uh, something like this. But there are, for instance, uh, you can use this uh, in uh, a real uh, useful uh, uh, industrial scenario. Because uh, you can uh, have a model that has learned uh, distribution. So you are doing anomaly detection. You want to learn a distribution that is uh, the distribution of what 
is good. Then, once you learn this, you can just feed your model with the new data and see if uh, this model is, uh, is see if this, is this data is uh, close or distance to the learning <laughs> distribution. So learning a distribution can be useful in the domain of the one classification or anomaly detection. But of course there are more uh, fancy utilization. For instance, uh, at Zuru we create a uh, BIM application, so, so house design and uh, we apply the generative models uh, on the floor plans to generate automatically rooms, buildings, uh, everything. So have you ever uh, used the algorithm to generate synthetic data sets? Synthetic data set, uh, no, but uh, we must uh, uh, need to create uh, a particular data set. So we generate, we learned a distribution, and we looked at the tails of this distribution to see if there are samples that, OK, are part of this distribution. We learn them, but they are far from the mean value, but are still good samples. And of course, it is always in the domain of anomaly detection. It is possible to use this uh, algorithm to uh, label unlabeled data. So if we have in the train set uh, uh, a set of uh, labeled data, for example, for a classification problem, and we want to extend this uh, train set with the other data, so let the, run the, the generator generate the label of uh, noise uh, input. So we try to learn the label and extend the training set, uh, the initial training set. Learn the label. So I instead of being as a discriminator output fake and real, have fake and uh, a set of classes. Of course, you can use, uh, uh, you can define a discriminator that uh, just uh, is not a binary classifier, but is uh, a multi-class classifier. But I don't know, and I never tried to create something that uh, use the adversarial training process <coughs> to label something uh, from the something generated. Of course, uh, I'm uh, pretty sure that uh, this is possible because of, there are uh, a lot of uh, applications that use uh, not a binary classifier, not a binary classifier, but a multi-class classifier. But perhaps uh, the most common uh, scenario to extend a data set is not to predict the label of something generated, but just to make the generator learn to generate something conditional on uh, the specific class and then feed it to a new data set. OK, oh, last one. Last one, and then, uh, well, you can always ask questions as long as you leave 10 minutes to the speaker to eat something. So we're going to go for the last question, then uh, we all move to the directory, OK? Thanks. Perhaps we can bring this over to the drinks. Anyway. Uh, it's also a very good trend for question about guns. Um, so we mentioned uh, in order to stop the training of guns, so we can have a look at the loss of the discriminator. Um, yeah, uh, so what I, wonder, what I was wondering is, uh, in theory, also in the beginning, when the discriminator is initialized randomly, you will also get a very bad classifier, so you will get uh, kind of a very, very low, uh, bad loss. Um, I'm aware of methods such as the inception score or this kind of methods to, to stop training of guns. Are you aware of any progress in that, in that perspective on how to stop training of guns? Not to stop this very good Lianz, um, for instance, uh, we use uh, something uh, particular because it depends uh, of the, on the data type. So if you have uh, a data type that has a well-known <coughs> distribution at the beginning, for instance, uh, the normal distribution, we can uh, just measure the difference between the generated distribution or target distribution. If uh, the distribution is more complex, for instance, we are working with images, Okay, there is the inception condition, the, the inception distance, the Fréchet distance. 
and uh, other businesses, but uh, of course, uh, when the distribution is complex, uh, the only way perhaps uh, is to use a pre-trained classifier uh, and to see if the generator uh, generates something meaningful. Okay, thank you. So just for your information, we will publish the slides, the links, uh, the recordings, possibly we'll also have uh, the article in the blog, uh, some summarizing everything we've seen today. Uh, also, I recommend if you really like the gun topic to look for the previous uh, event. The previous meetup was uh, another application of the generative and personal networks, so you can find it on our web website. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you.